questions. Um, this is the last in our series of seven um, forums that we've done. Um, we encourage you to go out and watch the, the previous six um, as well in, um, in terms of each of the various candidates. We did state's attorney last night. Um, we did all five districts of the county, um, and we did school board um, districts two and four. So, again, we encourage you to go out and watch those videos and, and before the primaries that are coming up. Ballots are already out. Mail-in ballots. Um, early voting actually starts on the 7th. We've been saying the 9th incorrectly for a couple weeks. Nobody corrected us till last night. So early voting is actually from the 7th to the 14th, and the primary is actually the 19th, the actual in primary day of um, voting. So lots of ways to get your vote in. Um, tonight we're doing the uh, Senate candidates for District 37. Um, we have two candidates with us, which is Addie Eckert and Johnny Mounts. Uh, Naomi Hyman uh, declined to attend the, the forum tonight. Um, so it's just the two candidates. There are three candidates for District 37 um, at this time. Um, we're going to do the same format we've done in the other events. Um, so it'll be a three-minute opening. So we each get three minutes to say what they want to say to start. Um, then we have a series of questions that they have seen. Um, we'll go through those, two-minute response to each of those. Um, we'll get through as many questions as we can. Um, then about 7.30, we'll give them three minutes to wrap up, and then we're done for the night. Um, again, I didn't neglect to introduce myself. I am Bill Christopher from the Dorchester Chamber. Um, we are doing this event in a combination with WHCP that is doing all the technology you see up front and making it so we can broadcast these and record them. Um, the, the Cambridge and Talbot Spy, who was just here, um, he's here, is also partnering with us and they're rebroadcasting. And then Mitchell Board of Realtors um, is working with us as well to pull these on because I think it's really important for you guys to hear what these candidates have to say and help you make the right decisions as you're going to the polls or mailing in your ballot or however you're casting your vote for this year. So. Um, with that and that introduction, we're going to get started. Um, Addie is going to lead us off with her three minutes, and then Johnny, and then we'll jump right into questions. So, Addie, how about it? Thank you very much, and good everybody. I'm glad to be here with you to share a little bit about me. I am Addie Eckert. I've been a member of the Senate for the last eight years. I am one of 15 Republicans in the Senate out of 47. I am one of two Republican women. And I serve on the Budget and Tax Committee. I've been on the Budget and Taxation Committee in the Senate for eight years. So that's put me in a pretty interesting position. I also serve on AELR, Administrative Legislative Executive Review Committee, the Audit Committee, and I review all of the health and human services activities and departments in this state. It's my, my privilege to serve the citizens of this district, and I have a lot of energy and a lot of projects, yes, to be accomplished. For my background, I'm, as many know, I'm an advanced practice psychiatric mental health nurse, spent about 40 years at Eastern Shore Hospital Center. I still work part-time, so I'm on the ground dealing with workforce issues and nursing issues on a regular basis, which has launched me into uh, actually a career of working on mental health and substance abuse. This past year, we were able to pass a number of pieces of legislation regarding at Suicide Fatality Review Board, and over the since 19 and 2017, I think I've passed solo about 45 pieces of legislation, and some of that I'll be integrating into the other questions this evening. I believe I've been an effective legislator. I've fought and st stood up on the Senate floor, uh, even against uh, the president the Senate president a number of years ago when we were debating and arguing uh, crab regulations and oyster issues because I believe somebody needs to stand up on behalf of our historic fisheries, our watermen, and our farmers on the regular basis. As you know, we voted for the biggest tax cut in history over the past eight years. This year we did pension reform and with addition, that was about $350 million worth of reductions. I have supported um, gun rights. I do believe we have plenty of gun laws on our books. It's a matter of not being able to enforce them to keep the guns out of the hands of the bad guys. And I'll be glad to talk some more in the rest of the questions. So I get to say, here's Johnny. Thank you. Uh, thank you, and uh, thank you to everyone. I usually don't do this, but I actually wrote down my words tonight because 
we've got three minutes, and I don't want to exceed those three minutes. Uh, it's, a, it's, an, it's an honor to be here with you. It's been an honor to serve in the legislature. Uh, my name's Johnny Mouts. I'm a resident of uh, St. Michael's, Talba County. I live there with, uh, with my two children and my wife, Rebecca. Uh, my mother is still there. My father was a dentist in Easton, and some people may know my brother, Dan. He gets around quite a bit and working at the hospital with the Red Cross. Um, it's important that you all are here, and I'm greatly uh, appreciative of your time tonight. Um, you know, we've had success in all parts of our district uh, throughout my term. I've served in the legislature for now, for now eight years, not just in Dorchester County, but in all four counties. Um, uh, and, and during that time, you know, I serve as a member of the uh, Dorchester County delegation. That's myself, Delegate Chris Adams, and Delegate Cherie Sample Hughes. So you've seen all of us. We all represent different parts of the area. Uh, however, um, I've tried to be available. Uh, a time ago, when someone once said to me, Johnny, we all voted for you, so you have to be there for the entire district. And I've tried to be that way. Um, you know, the decision to file for Senate was a serious one for me. Ultimately, it came down to who I felt would be best for our district and for our future. And I have a lot of respect. Uh, Senator Eckert is a friend of mine. I have admiration, and she's represented the Midshore as a legislator in Annapolis for the past 28 years. But she's also, in, at times, become part of the Annapolis establishment. And I'm going to give you two quick examples. Voting for the Blueprint for Maryland, which is a uh, statewide uh, problem with education right now. It's the largest tax increase in our state's history. And being the only Republican in the Senate, and I think the only Republican and the General Assembly to vote to give illegal aliens uh, taxpayer dollars. In the House of Delegates, I've been a strong and clear voice for Eastern Shore values and principles. In the Senate, I'll be the same voice. I'll work to control the growth of government, especially our spending and taxes. I'll work to protect every citizen's rights, civil, uh, excuse me, I'll work to protect every citizen's civil rights and civil liberties. The new narrative that people can live off the government has got to be rewritten. The old narrative needs to be established. Anyone, and that narrative is that anyone can dictate their future if they apply themselves and are willing to make the sacrifices to be successful. Whether it be working on the water, farming, manufacturing, or healthcare, I will work to support our small and independent businesses. I strongly support the rights of parents in education. Parents want to know and they should know, especially about any social agendas in education. I will support our teachers, and most importantly, policies that instill all children with confidence, reassurance, and encouragement. Finally, I'll support the police and all, of our, all our first responders. Thank you all very much. I've exceeded my time, even though I wrote down my notes. <laughs> and you can just keep the mic. Um, again, we're going to have you answer the first question. Um, and then we'll actually we'll start with the first question. So what would be your single top legislative agenda item in Annapolis in 2023? Well, we're going to have a number of issues coming up in, in, the, uh, in, in uh, next year's session. Clearly, spending the size of government is going to be uh, at the forefront. Our budget just increased 10%. However, here locally, and it's in every county, and that is our wastewater treatment policy. The use of the Bay Restoration Fund, the accessibility, the flexibility, um, how that is uh, funneled and how it's utilized locally, for me, is going to be a top priority in the next session. Patty, you'll take the same question. Thank you very much. And stormwater, water, wastewater. This is going to be a common theme, and the reason I share that. We've been working for 20 years on the Twin Cities, Secretary in East Newmarket, and that would also pull on Suicide Bridge Restaurant to be able to get an upgraded, even to BNR, uh, wastewater treatment plant. Part of the dilemma is that our small communities who do not have the tax base do not even have the revenues to be able to match the funds that we might receive from both the state and the federal level. We have another serious issue down at McNeil Point, and as you may know, I think the river down there is closed for fishing right now. And that's because we've had an ongoing problem with the BIP ponds, berm infiltration ponds. And when we have 150 of those in Dorchester County, and we have a lot of wetlands, and remember that our non-tidal wetlands are turning into tidal wetlands, 
and we don't have a tax base to be able to support the infrastructure we need, there has to be a remedy. My remedy, and I've worked with uh, both the federal level and the state level, the Department of the Environment, I think we need to clearly define the role of all the possible players in this to advocate for designated funding for our lower income counties who have high rates of water intrusion so that we are able to designate that funding and get adequate wastewater treatment which will reduce runoff and reduce nutrients into the bay. Thank you. And you just keep the microphone. Addie will give you the next question. Um, given the likelihood that the referendum for legalization of recreational cannabis will pass, uh, what are your proposals for the implementation in Maryland? Well, thank you very much. We still have a number of states where that is uh, not a possibility. Uh, I'm not saying I'm going to vote for anything, but I did have... I guess the opportunity to serve on the committee that was looking at the framework. So we spent over a year and a half taking the previous bill that would have designated a framework. And there are three things that have to be included in a framework if we go to adult use legalization. And that would be one, we're going to have to figure out, is this a jobs bill or is it taxation? Are we using the revenues for education? How are we going to designate it? And then we're going to have to regulate the heck out of it to make sure that it's safe. We do not want more kids being exposed to toxic substances to create more um, psychiatric illness and or substance abuse. And there are a lot of uh, research that supports that. So we have not even looked at what is the business model. That's all a part of legislation that had been proposed previously that we had worked on, but the Senate didn't prevail with providing that overarching framework. Um, the House prevailed on being able to do a lot of expungement and reduction of penalties um, and just put it up as do you support adult use recreational marijuana or not. So there's a lot of work to be done. We can build on what has been there. My concern is in states where there's been this kind of a lag, you have a referendum and then you don't set up the framework, you encourage more illegal activity and that's a major concern if you want to get that legal, illegal activity into legal activity, which is a part of the whole business model. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Johnny, the same question for you. Um, well, well, that's exactly right. Um, one of the major problems that, that we are going to incur on a policy level is going to be the black market. I mean, there's, there is illegal drugs on the streets right now, and nothing's going to make that go away. Um, the funding that comes out of um, recreational marijuana it, that is a, a, an enormous question, an enormous problem, because it's still banned federally. So that money has to be handled in a different manner. And I'm not certain how the state's going to do that, because the state likes to control funds in a certain kind of way. I, I do know specifically um, if this is, this is likely to go forward. It's one of the highest poll, most popular issues everywhere. Um, locally, you know, standards for driving under the influence, standards to protect children in our schools. Um, it hasn't been legalized recreational, and marijuana use in some form or fashion is prevalent now in schools. It's not an uncommon thing. Once it's legalized for recreational use, the, uh, the potential is no longer potential. It's going to be a day-to-day -day problem. Um, public consent public consumption and protecting the rights of citizens. The rules that, that are laid or established for how recreational marijuana is going to be used are absolutely critical. So those that want to partake are able to partake. However, those who do not want to be uh, uh, affected or influenced are not forced to live with something they don't want to have to live with. And then finally, Law enforcement has invested millions of dollars into all sorts of anti-drug activity, and that a lot of that will get washed out once marijuana is recreationally approved. And they need to be funded so they can retrain and retool to be able to do the job they're required to do. You can just hold on to the mic. You'll get the next question. Thank you. So um, this was a little longer, but um, the use and health of the bay and its tributaries has long been a concern for the eastern shore. How do you 
um, plan to help bridge the gap between the cultural heritage and the new economies that are emerging for its use and protection. Okay, so our, our, our problem, we right now, there are abhorrent levels of discharge coming out of Jones Fall from Patasco, Patapsco River, uh, waste, Patapsco Wastewater Treatment Facility, and Back River Wastewater Treatment Facility. So no matter what we do here locally, and we do a lot on a daily basis, the Chesapeake Bay is gonna to continue to suffer. And what's happening on a daily basis, it's reported, it's documented. Uh, levels that are so far beyond acceptable levels um, occur on a daily basis in those two locations. While we curtail and, and, um, and, and, and do the best we can to try to protect the Chesapeake Bay, that problem has to be fixed. That's the foundation of the Chesapeake Bay. The Susquehanna River, the dam, that's a significant problem. But those, those two factors cannot be ignored and they have got to be addressed immediately. I'm um, talking about new technologies. I love the example of uh, aquaculture and, uh, and traditional oyster harvesting. The old guys don't wanna do aquaculture. They, they're, they know how to oyster, this is how they work. The young guys, and there aren't enough of them, They'll do aquaculture and they'll do traditional harvesting. So the trick is, is to be able to keep both of those industries afloat so they can work in concert and not to undermine or try to um, pit one against the other. The two work in harmony. And I think they're a great example for how we transition to the future um, and a successful um, environmental technique. Addy, same question Thank for you. very much. I was trying to figure out what the question really was looking for hmm. uh, with the combination of our cultural heritage and the new economies that hmm. are emerging. And I was thinking in terms of, you know, we really have yet to address the whole issue of new ways of treating wastewater. Um, so I set out on a quest to be able to talk to a number of companies, and there are some new ways to deal with that that we need to be looking at because they may be more efficient and less uh, expensive in the long run. So that's one option that we haven't even talked about. How we do with gray water and think about that, um, we haven't gone there yet. And uh, I put in a bill and some people thought it was kind of a crazy bill. It was intended to spark a discussion on the whole issue of gray water and then our municipal treatment plants and how we do, do deal with wastewater treatment in our rural sensitive areas, but yet being able to maintain, A, the livelihood of our folks, and also be able to maintain the historical integrity of our, our waterways and our water's edge, if you will. The other one has to do with oyster aquaculture because, you know, traditionally we've used shucking houses. I, I worked on a bill this year to bring our historic shucking houses back, but that sparked a very interesting discussion because, as you know, with our oyster aquaculture, there are now new technologies to be able to shuck oysters in a new way, and it's gonna be right here in downtown Cambridge. So how we balance that, and I think it is a matter of balance. How do we allow all of these to be able to prevail at the same time because any oyster in our tributary and in our waterways is going to be doing nutrient removal, and that's absolutely essential. We could talk about nutrient trading and credit trading, and that's a whole other issue that I think is on the horizon for expansion. And you get to keep the mic. And I am going to jump down a couple of questions because I think you guys started touching on this one a little bit with your answers here and a little earlier, so we'll just kind of stay with it. Um, how should the state approach the environmental concerns being raised by the large new housing developments like the one in Trap? Well, that's the perfect storm. Um, one of the things I talked about earlier, when you have a treatment plant like Twin Cities, and guess what? It hasn't been even to BNR uh, for 20 years. We've been struggling to get those funds. What went on in Trap uh, years ago the citizens, some 800 citizens in Trap went ahead and they put up about five to 10,000 per household to pay for a new BNR treatment plan. Guess what? They paid for it, they applied for it, and there were some 
interested parties who said that's not good enough. The engineering had already been done, the study had already been done, and they were ready to go out for bid And they were, after they got their permit, and there was a hold put on it. Guess what? That's been some 10 or 15 years ago, maybe even 20 years. So here you have a small town of Trap that has no way to generate revenues to be able to upgrade their treatment plant. What alternative do they have except to go out and annex some more property, be able to expand? They put all of their growth allotment in one place determine whether it would be compatible with agriculture land in the community, put it out to referendum twice, and then guess what? Here we are. The treatment plant was never done back then because they didn't have the funding to go from BNR to ENR, and the citizens said enough was enough. So we need to be careful of what we're doing now so that we don't further exacerbate these kinds of situations. Same question. Yep. Yeah, and, and I, the uh, the situation in Trap is clearly a wastewater treatment issue, um, and wastewater treatment issues have come up in other um, uh, community association type settings. And um, you know, th the difference is is that Trap had not been constructed. Many many of the situations have come up was was because of a failing system, something that had been approved, it existed, it operated, and then it failed. Um, this is a different situation where um, the permits. The buildings, the buildings, the homes had not been constructed. And, and to me, it behooves our counties to take the time to review how these permits are issued so they know once the permit's been approved and the Department of Environment is told that the permits have been approved, that the builders that are moving forward know that that guarantee and that approval from the county is rock solid. Um, there isn't an individual to point a finger at, but it gives the scenario where there was a gap, there was a problem, and, and that should be an example so that it doesn't happen again. We're going to fight to do what we can, or at least I'm going to fight to do what I can to try to improve funding and resources and options and alternatives to deal with wastewater, but in the, in the time being, in the near term, there is enormous pressure right now for development on in this area of the peninsula, and it behooves all the local governments to take a look at what happened in TRAP and to make sure that is not repeated. All right, and keep the mic. The next question is for you, and it's it's infrastructure, but different infrastructure. So um, infrastructure in the state has deteriorated significantly since the changes in the allocation of the highway user funds. Um, it's great that some of those are coming back um, but and being returned to local controls, but the amounts are falling way short of what's needed to address the issues that are here now. How do you propose we reduce the backlog of work that has built up over time? It's funny because I want to talk about the gas tax when you asked me that question. You know, so the, the Transportation Trust Fund is doing wonderfully right now with the price of gas. Mm -hmm. However, we've got the percentages that don't get the funds to the local governments to be able to do the work that they need to do um, on an annual basis. However, this has been prolonged, so the work has been backed up. Um, there is no easy solution to this, to this question. Um, how, we know where the state is and we know where the state funding is. Um, Dorchester County is unique in the large number of county-owned roads that Dorchester County has to maintain. Changing the formula, finding a way to get more funding for Dorchester County is a simple answer. However, you know, the, uh, the response on that answer is very questionable. And considering the rec in upcoming recession, the budget of last year, and the fiscal, um, the fiscal challenges that we're going to be facing, uh, clearly projects need to be prioritized um, uh, but on a, on a, on a, on another from another perspective also we need to maybe consider some alternative sources of revenue I don't know exactly where or how they come from but one that we're going to discuss when we mentioned uh, the gas tax is is a, is a fee or um, some sort of, of, of a cost associated with electric vehicles right now they don't consume gas they do not provide revenue for the Transportation Trust Fund, and they do use the roads. Yep. And so, Addie, same question. Thank you very much. Well, it may resolve itself because workforce shortage is a major initiative. And yes, um, the Transportation Trust Fund funds 
two mass transit systems and roads and bridges. Um, and in the past, we had more money for roads and bridges and less for transit. Now we have more money for transit and less for roads and bridges. Um, when the highway user revenues were given back and we had a formula that was determined through legislation in our committee, one of the things to keep in mind, there's something in the Transportation Trust Fund covering roads and bridges that's called system preservation. They're the projects that are done statewide. What happened with the highway user revenues, that money from system preservation has now been shifted back to the locals so that they will be able to catch up on their projects. My suggestion is that because we have a shortage in the workforce, we're only going to be able to do so many projects so quickly. So it's a matter of each of our counties being very aggressive with what they can do with the resources they have. And then we as legislators need to monitor that so that when we have our transportation roundabout, each year the transportation folks come around and we talk about local priorities. Each legislator has to have the list of those priorities in advance. That we can look at what those priorities are and then determine what the next steps will be and how much highway user revenue needs to be shifted again from System preservation. The bigger issue is how do we fund mass transit and roads and bridges because they're all from the same uh, gas sales tax and they're also from some of our registration fees. With the electric vehicles, we have to find an alternate way of having electric vehicles pay their fair share. All right, and keep the mic. And so since, since you guys want to jump to gas, we'll jump to that one now real quick because it kind of ties into this. So inflation is hitting Marylanders hard. That's an understatement, I think. But the price of fuel alone is creating a significant hardship for many. And the 18% increase in gas tax that's going to happen in July will only make it worse. How do you recommend the Maryland legislation respond? Well, I had a bill that we put in that would have uh, two bills. The one would have eliminated that escalator on the gas tax, to with, so that would never have happened completely, take it away, which we will probably do again. Um, the other one was a second bill that would have suspended that escalator for two years to be able to see how this was going to play out with what was going on between um, the Ukraine and Russia and how that impacted everything else. It's about $100 million a month. Um, to be able to look at that with that decrease. We were willing to go that route. We thought that was a better way. Many of us thought that was a much better way than giving that month of gas tax relief because what happened, as you all know, the gas was here, you got a reprieve, and then when we went back, what happened? It doubled um, that gas tax. But that would be one way to address that moving forward. There's some discussion about a special session to be able to do that, do that quickly, and go ahead and pass that legislatively so that we will get that gas tax relief. Uh, absolutely. This is the perfect example, the perfect case why we should not have an automatic escalator for the gas tax. Um, you know, that should be repealed. And the, the legislature ought to renew or have a vote or have some public discourse on any time taxes are increased. Um, uh, many people didn't realize that there was an automatic increase with the gas tax. Well, you can't help but uh, realize the price of gas right now and what everyone's paying. Um, uh, there, there's a way. I mean, the government can tell how much money it's supposed to collect in gas tax. With the exceptional prices, I would say we go one step further than take away the escalator. We could get to a point and cap the gas tax, how much money is the state of Maryland going to collect from its citizens? Um, uh, this is a, a dire time. The price of gas isn't the only cost that's through the roof right now. Um, but for the short term, definitely eliminate the uh, automatic escalator. And I would even recommend going one step further and capping how much of that revenue is going to be collected. All right, so let's stay on energy here a little bit. I'm really jumping around on you now, so don't try to follow on your sheets. Um, please just uh, detail your position on renewable energy sources in our state, including solar farms and wind energy. Sure. So 
I'm going to leave my glasses on because there's a lot to talk about with this, and I'm going to try to keep it under two minutes. But, but, you know, renewable energy, everybody loves renewable energy. It's fantastic. It's the future. But we need to realize that renewable energy cannot provide the baseload energy that citizens need to live the lives that they're used to living. And there's, in, there's examples throughout the country right now. Uh, there, are ro there are states with rolling brownouts. And these aren't uh, um, just news articles. They're fundamental problems in their society. Um, I firmly believe, well, getting back to the baseload issue, renewable energy, nuclear needs to be considered. Uh, the the uh, justification for um, renewable energy is a clean environment. Nuclear energy provides the base load energy that would keep society running, and it would take Maryland to a net zero greenhouse emissions gas within five years of being implemented. Um, that being said, uh, there are a number of issues that, that accompany renewable energy, uh, namely the rights of landowners and, and, uh, and how they see fit to, to use their land without government interference, and I strongly support their right to use their land um, as they see fit. There are also broader considerations in how they use their land. Um, they, we haven't established guidelines yet. But, you know, some of the renewable energies, specifically solar panels, bring a, um, a, a, a serious environmental concern with them because they have a number of chemicals inside of them. Uh, we are ground zero for renewable energy. Our land is flat. Uh, it's, uh, it's priced well. Our grid is challenged. They can't handle uh, energy produced uh, in various parts coming on at the same time. Um, and, uh, uh, and the renew renewable portfolio standard is something I have not support supported increasing because that's an energy tax pass on to, uh, to rate payers. Um, that being said, my time is up. Thank you very much. I think diversification on energy is the way to go. Um, for years, I was a fan of clean coal. Um, people called me a dinosaur back at that time. Um, we ship coal to other countries as we speak. Um, natural gas is a clean way to go, um, but there seems to be a move afoot to electrify everything, but it takes a, a source of power to move electricity, and we don't have that kind of infrastructure. So solar, wind, nuclear um, are all, natural gas are all reasonable sources in a diversified portfolio. Unfortunately for us here on the Eastern Shore and the Mid Shore, we don't have any generation. So our costs are much higher than elsewhere because we depend on the grid, which is further away from us. So those transmission costs are, are pretty expensive and escalate our cost. Um, Solar, many of our solar f um, projects that are moving into our community, a lot of those determination of where they go and uh, is out of our hands because it's public service commission determination and we need to make some steps to begin to bring that back into local control because it's, it's local control that's going to determine how much usable ag we need and how much we can turn that into solar. Um, in addition to that wind, both solar and wind still need the grid. They still need electricity to move it and the infrastructure is not there and a lot of the people who understand that infrastructure were not at the table when we passed the bill this year and that's part of the dilemma we find ourselves in because we have great ideas but we don't have the nuts and bolts and the workable solutions to make it a reality that's cost effective for all citizens. All right, and just hold on to the mic. Sh shift gears completely on you right now. Um, how important is tourism to District 37 and the Eastern Shore as a whole and what legislation would you support to increase tourism? Well, tourism is really important. We've done uh, historic tax credits to be able to refurbish buildings. And as you know, over at the Packing House, that's a major initiative there. We have our main streets. That's part of promoting tourism. We have our heritage area that were created a number of years ago, legislation I worked on, all um, instill and encourage um, tourism. We have a lot of deep, rich cultural heritage history 
Um, and a lot of our groups are, are working together to be able to pool resources, to be able to encourage that historic tourism. Um, maintaining the budget, um, I think, is, is part of what has already been established. And I would say there is adequate funding in the budget right now to be able to promote tourism in a reasonable way. And remember, we have Marbidco, we have a number of rural Maryland initiatives as well that all can be a part of, of building that profile. But I would say right now we have a lot of folks coming in to uh, our area because of our rich cultural heritage in all of our communities, Dorchester, Caroline, Talbot, and White Comico. Mm -hmm. Same question. Um, yeah, tourism is a um, is a very effective industry for the Eastern Shore. Um, there's there's no um, uh, there's no input. We're here. And people want to come to the Eastern Shore. They want to see the Eastern Shore. They want to experience the Eastern Shore. And some people just go to the Eastern Shore because they want to get away. And uh, and that's fine. But uh, that means revenues coming in. Um, and I think the the best way to support tourism, which I have and will continue to do. Is, uh, is through our local tourism boards. There's a budget. Um, that budget is, is funded through tourism-related dollars. Um, so the question of whether it's a tax or a fee, um, you can make that decision for yourself. But clearly, tourism is a um, driving economic factor on the shore. Um, and, and making sure that the funds from tourism go back into tourism um, to help promote the Eastern Shore um, is going to be critical. The, the fear, and I want to be clear about it, is that money isn't diverted to something else. And that money, the tourism dollars stay in tourism. And that the tourism dollars go to the locals and are not held by, uh, by, the, by the state government. All right. Thank, thank you. All right. Let's jump to a couple of school questions. We'll kind of hit them together. There's three of them on here. Um, so the first one is, how do you see Kerwin impacting Dorchester County schools? And what can be done to improve schools in our county? Well, Kerwin is going to be a burden on Dorchester County Schools because of the funding requirements, and we've already seen that. Um, uh, there's no way to get around it. Um, Kerwin was promoted as something that wouldn't have an immediate impact, and it's already had an impact. Um, and, and it's a challenge. And I think the, the first step uh, that needs to be um, addressed is, is, it, is the funding, is to, to um, provide some stability for funding for, for local school districts. Um, uh, just just this last year, um, you know, we, we had uh, had to do additional emergency spending because education funding that was supposed to be provided was not provided. In preparing for today, I was reading the 90-day report, which doesn't even match. 90-day report is prepared by the Department of Legislative Services. It's a document that's it's very reliable, and it provides an explanation on funding for education. And it gave a, a breakdown for Dorchester County education funding. However, a week ago, our superintendent of schools received another document from the State Department of Education that was different than the report that was in, uh, in the Department of Legislative Services 90-day report. This has got to get sorted out because local governments cannot react in a week's time with bad news financially. They are strapped right now. And so that would be a priority. Thank you very much. There has been a discrepancy between the, the numbers that uh, Legislative Services has put out and the numbers that have come out from the State Board of Education, and that did have to be adjusted. Um, and there are issues that we're going to have to address, but the other question is, and I did vote for Kerr, and, when, and I was criticized for it, but the bottom line was the reason I voted for it because our $20 million leveraged about $80 million in additional funding that we really did need because we do not have the resource to be able to e increase teacher salaries. We do not have the opportunities for early childhood education or funded pre-K and kindergarten. We did not have the opportunity to have school um, nurse support and be able to have community schools so that we had extra wraparound services for many of our needy children because we do have multicultural issues, language, English is a second language. There are a lot of issues that weren't being addressed across the board. Does it 
is it localized in two of our main jurisdictions? Yes, probably Baltimore City and Prince George's County. And those school systems do need to get their house in order. But for the Eastern Shore, I checked around to all the treasures this year because I had heard so much about the burden of Kerwin. And I said, how are your revenues? And nobody said they were having a problem funding Kerwin this year. Are there issues that need to be addressed because in equities? Yes. And that is something that I've already started a conversation with Senator King on our committee because there are issues that need to be involved. There are some 13 for funding formulas that are taking into account for each county when that budget is put together and then when the matching funds are put together. So I would think it's one too many formulas to trip over in being able to calculate the right numbers to determine what our communities need. All right, and keep the mic, we'll stay on the schools. Um, critical race theory has become a polarizing topic. Um, what legislative position do you think the state of Maryland should take as it relates to critical race theory? Critical race theory has been something that has really generated a lot of passion for everybody. I think the broader issue is, do we have parental involvement and engagement with curriculums in our school? Whether it's critical race or sex education or there are a number of different issues that uh, at least folks have brought to my attention. The bottom line is, how do we have citizen involvement? How do we have our parents engaged in that? I had one of our local teachers said to me, I couldn't even get chaperones for the dance this year because we have an absence of parents in a lot of our schools. We have some schools where parents are very much involved. Uh, at the state board, the decisions are made for various parts of the curriculum uh, generally. That then gets transferred on down to the local school jurisdictions, the local Boards of Ed then have um, parent advisory groups to be able to look at that curriculum. Now, parents should be uh, further involved in that. When I did a little search on where some of this was coming from, I found that there are resources that are being used. Some are determined by the local school boards. Some are determined um, than by the classroom teachers and resources provided. But I think it's really important on a number of these issues that we clarify the terms, know where it's coming from, and if push comes to shove, I sit on the AELR committee, and one of the things we can do when those regulations come down and go into law, we can make sure that we have parent uh, oversight and advisory groups to be able to address those in more of a hearing fashion to be able to make sure we're on top of those issues. Same question. Yeah, and, and critical race theory is is an issue that, ra that, that is raised through resources that are used through teaching. Um, it's based on a, um, a theory of cynicism, a theory that society is unfair, it's unjust, and it's not right. Um, and, and that theory um, is axiomatic to the classroom, the school system, and what, what we want to reinforce um, in, in, our, in our education system. Um, however, however we can limit, identify, or prevent that from getting into our education system, the better we will be. Because the cynical theory divides, and that breaks society apart. It doesn't bring it together. And it can very easily be misunderstood. All children should have self-confidence. All children should feel worth. All children should be treated the same. That's a completely different discussion. But these are resource materials that need to be identified um, and, and, and they need to be addressed um, because parents want to know what's going on in the classroom and how their children are being taught, including this one. I've got a 12-year-old and a 14-year-old. I'm with kids a lot, you know, and uh, that's a longer conversation. However, it, the focus should be on these resources and how they're getting into our school system. We want kids to grow up healthy, happy, and loving one another, not trying to distinguish one another. Critical race theory is a, is a serious issue. And you just keep the mic, you have the next question. Staying on schools. So the school shooting tragedy in Texas has many Maryland parents asking what can be done to better protect Maryland children. 
Um, what do you propose would have the largest impact on the safety of our students? I'm a um, very strong supporter of school resource officers, just as I'm a strong supporter of law enforcement. Um, defund police is a step in the wrong direction. Um, we ought to have access to school resource officers. I will support funding for school resource officers. Um, there's been efforts to prohibit school resource officers um, in schools. Um, uh, they play a, a, a very important role and um, the immediate um, the immediate step to take is to make sure we have enough school resource officers and that, uh, and that we have the um, um, support uh, for law enforcement to support our school systems. All schools should be locked. Um, all schools should be protected. However, at making sure the school resource officers are there and present is the best first line of, uh, of, uh, of, of safety to make sure something terrible doesn't happen. Thank you very much. Dorchester County has a model program for school safety. Um, it's an integrated program. If you haven't had the opportunity to go into one of Dorchester County schools, go in and check it out. I, I had the opportunity to stumble onto it visiting one of the schools, and it uh, has an app. You can identify what weapon comes in through the schools. You have three or four different scenarios on how to respond, who responds. So the answer to, to the violence question uh, I think in any of our communities, first of all, you do have to fund the police. Police have to have the powers to police, but we seem to be taking that away through the legislative arena, and that's gonna be an ongoing problem with some justice reform I am concerned about. In um, addition to that, we need to put resources into early child care, prenatal care, to make sure that our kids are growing up with the kind of resources and support that they need to be prepared to come to school ready to learn and are able to build a sense of confidence and respect and self-esteem, to be able to build relationships with kids through various kinds of activities, early intervention when kids are upset. The day that I was in Mesa's Lane when the system went in, I asked, I asked the construction people who were installing this equipment, you know, what else was being done in the school to deal with kids who were troubled? And they gave me a whole list of early interventions on what the teachers do, what the faculty do, um, and what other people do to be able to identify kids who might be at risk to be able to provide the services and the support that they need through relationships. In addition to that, we have community groups that are working on how also do we need to provide the resources that our kids need. So it's multifaceted. All right, and staying with you, the, you just touched on this a bit, so it kind of relates into this. What's your opinion on the changes recently enacted by the General Assembly regarding policing, for example, repealing Law Enforcement Bill of Rights? I think that was a gross mistake. The uh, Law Enforcement Bill of Rights was a carefully crafted document that was developed over years to be able to have police involved um, with policing their own, if you will. That was taken away, and now we have a situation where we have community policing boards so that the police won't even be involved in that until after the community board has an opportunity to review and make recommendations. I mean, I read, I'm reading a book recently, and it's called The Death of Expertise, and it just boggles my mind that we are taking the experts in police and public safety are our police, and we are taking that away from them. Does there need to be community policing? Yes, I mean, that's the best of all worlds, but it's our police being able to do their job working together with the public, with the community, to build relationships so that they can maintain the respect and maintain law and order, maintain discipline, and to support all of us. Um, my concern is that we have so many laws on the books right now that with some of the police reform, our police are not going to be in a safe position to go ahead and execute those laws and be able to process 
um, criminals when they need to be dealt with. Um, so this is a real step in. We have taken all kinds of groups of people to meet with um, the uh, Senate uh, JPR committee to be able to talk about when that police reform was done. It really disrupted good policing strategies and relationships with the community that we won't be able to restore for a long time. And juvenile justice reform is another piece of the puzzle where we're not going to be able to prosecute kids 13 and under. And that's going to be a whole other issue. So what tools do the police have to be able to interrupt disruptive behavior early on so that you can modify it and begin to help um, put some corrective action and some positive um, in with those kids' lives? Yeah, it's, it's kind of funny because I, um, I, I spent a lot of time making jokes and having fun and stuff. And um, then a couple of people in a, a, that mentioned to me said, Johnny, you seem grumpy. You seem grumpy lately. What's going on? What's going on? I think it all started with the police reform. Uh, that, this legislation, it's not just the, the um, repealing the, uh, the enforcement bill of rights. Just about every step of the way in this police reform legislation that was passed has been problematic. And when I mean problematic, we're talking about public safety. And it's just so discouraging and it's so frustrating. Clearly, the, the repealing the, the, bill, the police bill of rights was a, was a step in the wrong direction. Um, it's not enhancing public safety. It's not improving the way police police, which is what that was supposed to do. It's supposed to improve the way police police. And then if you get into a little bit, go a little further into what was done with police reform, you'll find right now and I'm not sure, I've got to verify this, but I don't believe that our departments even have training information on the new standard use of force. That's fundamental for conducting the job. Um, and there are step after step. That's just the technicality and the reality of what we're dealing with. But the message to the criminals is the police can't do what the police used to do. And that's the wrong message to send right now. That is the wrong message. And it started with police reform, and it has got to stop. Um, uh, I, I don't think citizens are going to take it. They're going to want to fight back. And uh, this is, um, it's, it was a mistake, and I'm hoping, I'm hoping we can find some ways to fix it. And it's something that in the Senate I will stand up uh, loud and clearly about uh, to make sure our values and principles are heard. Cool. All right. So you just hold on to the mic. We'll give you the uh, the next question. Um, and you touched you touched on this one a little earlier, but I think you can expand on it um, a bit on this one. Um, so, how do you see yourself as a defender of property rights, and how does that relate to things like renewable energy, tidal rise, rails to trails, et cetera? Well, I, I, fundamentally, property rights. It's your property. Uh, you know, you have a constitutional right to that property. Um, to the extent that you should be able to use your property freely and how you, how you choose to use it comes to the extent to how you affect others around you. Um, that's when they, you run into some limitations. However, we um, on the Eastern Shore know that we own the property and we have the right to use it however we choose to use it, but there are a number of other things that we need to take in consideration. Chesapeake Bay, um, uh, air quality, there's just a number of things that come into play. Um, you have to support the environment. You need to protect the environment. Um, but uh, any way we can, I can work uh, to uh, reinforce and support property, white, property rights, um, um, that is a, a very important fundamental issue, especially when it comes to things like the government taking your property and making sure that you're compensated uh, rightly. Um, so I'm a strong supporter of property rights. Addie, same question. Thank you very much. Yeah, you cannot take anybody's property without compensation, and that gets to be an ongoing issue. I mean, if you look at some places in the more metropolitan areas where there have been highways built, and you know, the acquisition of right of way is always a big issue, and how much. We had a situation in one of our other counties where there was quick take. A quick take means that the government can come in and take your property and not adequately compensate you. And we went round and round about that. We were finally able to make sure that that property owner was adequately compensated 
um, because he took a hit in his business that impacted him for several years. I think the bigger issue for us in Dorchester County is how do we handle um, with our low-lying areas where property is, um, is going underwater, if you will, and do we relocate people? Do we fund that? How do we think about that? Because right now, you know, we put in place um, with the change in standard for insurance company um, insurance coverage for flooding that you have to have your property up so many feet you know well how far up do we go on raising properties before maybe there has to be consideration of relocation and how will that be compensated so that that's one of the issues but how do we address that uh, also with um, some of our solar fields you know how far how far do we go with that as well? So there are a number of different areas with how do you acquire even rails to trails? If you have very, I know they wanted to put the rails to trails above Easton a number of years ago, but there was concern because you would have to then get right away from all of the farm fields, and that was a major concern to many of those families. So that project did not move forward because those property owners had the right to say, this is not considered a good use of our property and we will not participate in that. But just think of those kinds of discussions that could go on between property owners and governments as they move forward with these kind of initiatives. And staying with you, and actually you, you started touching on this already, so we'll stay right with the topic. So what long-term solutions do you see to better protect Dorchester County and surrounding areas from increased threat of climate change and flooding? Well, um, I want to get back to uh, on the property rights issue. Hmm. I think for many of our families where we do have um, failing bit ponds, if you will, that property value will devalue if we don't come to terms with how we do wastewater treatment. Um, and, and that means a, a tremendous cost. So when it comes to, as I said in the beginning, when it comes to wastewater treatment, I think we need to make sure we make a strong case for low-income counties where a lot of the property owners who are paying the lion's share of property taxes, we need to make sure there's adequate wastewater treatment system and looking that from a systems perspective. That is one way to go ahead and designate that because if we want to make, to make sure we have a balance of having enough revenue to fund the match that's required for any of the initiatives, the funding initiatives that we might take advantage of, we make, need to make sure that there's an adequate balance there. So taking advantage of those resources, but then working together with some of our other federal and state partners and organizations to get everybody's engagement to work together on a combined strategy to be able to move forward, to put the mechanisms in place for that, um, that sea level rise, if you will, or water intrusion or saltwater intrusion are all a number of the issues we're gonna be facing. I would say that the Mid-Bay Islands are one way to protect part of our shoreline down in Taylor's Island and Hooper's Island, and that will be one solution, but we need many because we are so low. Okay. So Dor Dorchester County is ground zero, um, ground zero for, for flooding and, um, and um, climate change impact. And uh, the time to act is to act, you know, as, as quickly as quickly as possible. Um, and down in Hoopersville and Hoopers, Hoopers Island, we've got a group that has um, organized. Uh, they've been working on this for a couple of years. Um, they've had the Department of Natural Resources bring in an engineer, and they've done a detailed study of the entire island from the end of Hoopersville clear back um, to the bridge, and um, and identifying. Um, uh, easy to easy to easy to harden, expensive to harden, and very expensive to harden. And they've laid out a map on how to save um, Hooper's Island, Hoopersville Island, and and to protect protect that whole area. And and what's significant about that is that it's going to go underwater. There's going to be flooding, but if it can be protected, all the land behind it is going to be saved. 
And that's what's significant about the Mid Bay project. And, and people go both ways on Mid Bay, but Mid Bay is a barrier, those are barrier islands that are being protected. And they're going to protect the shoreline. So anywhere we can find a barrier island or find a, um, a plan to save a barrier island, that ought to be a top priority. Um, this area has received a high priority for the federal government. Um, and we have the work being done right now in Mid Bay. So the opportunity is before us now to get plans underway. So I would say the answer is, is to get to work and to get these plans drawn up as quickly as possible. All right. So to jump back to a, an earlier question, this has been asked a lot. So that's why we put it on the, on the, on the question sheet, talking about the Bill Burton Fishing Pier. So what do you guys know about the Bill Burton Fishing Pier, and what do you think can be done to repair it or do things with it at this point? Yeah, it's a trap. That the bill, the closing of that pier is a travesty. Um, so many people actually caught their food. That, that's they ate the food. That's where they got their their uh, um, nutrition, especially now with the price of food in the grocery store. Um, the the state's in a difficult spot <clears throat> to repair the bridge. It's exorbitantly expensive. Um, uh, to 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 uh, demolish the bridge is going to be very expensive. Um, and in talking to the Department of Natural Resources. They want to build a new bridge, um, but they, I don't think they know where to start. And I think the best thing that can happen would be for the county or the town or the chamber or an entity, a group to form, to get together and make a proposal to the department on what would best suit the needs, the local needs. And there are some needs and some desires to go fish in those same locations, not locally. But, you know, we need to take care of, of home first. So I think the best thing that can happen is for a formal proposal to be made, this is what we want in replacement. We don't want a bridge all the way across, or we do want a bridge all the way across. Or we do want to be able to have a bridge on one side, or we want to have a bridge on another side. I, I don't think the plans would be to uh, build another concrete bridge, but to have a fishing-type pier uh, right there by the city of Cambridge. But, um, but it's a serious issue because the dollars to repair that bridge or do anything with it are just, they don't make sense. So um, uh, I think the local direction will be, uh, would be the best thing we can do. Thank you. We've had many conversations about this because I walk down there every day. Um, and every day I see um, fish being cut up on the, on the boardwalk there because folks are fishing under the bridge right now. The neighbors have also asked, since the pier has been closed, if we could extend the closure out so that you could at least use the walkway. Part of the dilemma with that is where people are going to park. It costs some $40 million to either think about a new structure or demolish it, so double that. It's pretty exorbitant. And the other issue is we've thrown it over, I guess, to CWDI, the Cambridge Waterfront Group. And the Department of Natural Resources will be meeting with local folks to get their perspective on where to put that fishing pier. They will replace it, and it's a matter of where it goes and what is the best, I guess, engineering design to be able to do that. I think it's going to probably take the next two to two and a half years because you figure we do have some funding that may come through with the parks expansion that we did this past year. But you have to do a thorough assessment of what would be an interim strategy, what would be the next strategy. But you have to have the input of everybody as we work through what we want here on the waterfront. So those community conversations will be going on to determine what are the possible scenarios for placement of that fishing pier. And then you're going to have to have acquisition and construction. Demolition will all become a part of that. So, you know, we're looking at a two to three year initiative and in my best guesstimate in discussing this with the secretary. Great, thank you. And staying with you, you both touched on this a bit, so I'm going to go to this question about funding because there's a lot of funding and a lot of folks don't understand how bond requests work and all those kind of things. So how do you evaluate projects that make requests for funding to be included in the state budget to determine which ones you will support? Uh, there, are two, there are a number of different ways. Uh, all of the departments have a capital 
fund, if you will, their initiatives then are made through the recommendations through the Department of Natural Resources, through the Department of Housing and Development, through Department of Ag. There are a number, of, like uh, we just did the lab down in uh, Salisbury, that was a Department of Ag initiative. In addition to those that would be um, worked through the various departments, um, including housing and community uh, funding monies, that budget is presented to us. But every year, there are other monies the governor may include, what are called legislative bond initiatives. Um, sometimes the governor includes it, sometimes he does not. When that is included in the budget, then anybody can make a request. It used to be that all those requests would come through county government, but as more and more legislators go to MAKO and MML and talk about there is this pot of money available, you need to take advantage of it, it's kind of opened the floodgate so now, more and more not-for-profit organizations and other organizations and um, fire departments and historical preservation projects and uh, a lot of service um, food banks, mental health facilities, a lot of not-for-profits are coming to the legislators. What we usually do is get a list of those and then ask that they go back and be authorized through the county and the city before they can back up to us. And then we can, each legislator then can make a recommendation, but it's only a recommendation because the capital budget um, subcommittee out of budget and tax makes the ultimate determination with the budget, capital budget committee out of the appropriation. They usually try to distribute those monies around the state so that everybody has access to getting something for their community. Same question. Yeah, along those lines, um, for specific projects, you know, they, they need to be supported locally. Um, they need to have a community purpose. Um, they, they can't benefit one limited area. It's, it's got to be a community type project. And, and it's best if they're feasibly sustainable. And that's part of the process of of recommending um, a, a project be funded. But um, one thing that stands out um, amongst projects and requested projects are ones that, um, that would not otherwise be able to raise the funds that are needed to achieve the goal of the community service. So that's, that's probably one of the, one of the paramount um, thresholds you look for. However, I think, as it was explained, you, any project, any proposals is up for consideration. It's just a matter of um, a matter of uh, you know what other projects are pending and and um, and how they'll benefit and who they'll benefit and um, how much funds are available to help support them already. All right. So the uh, next question: uh, What is your understanding of affordable workforce housing? Housing, and would you support additional development tax incentives for the creation or redevelopment of affordable workforce housing? Uh, yeah, I have supported affordable workforce housing. Generally speaking, it's a it's a hundred hundred and twenty percent or below of the median um, income. Um, there are a number of programs administered by the Department of Housing that fund affordable housing programs. They come in all shapes and sizes. Um, I think that the, the demand, you know, this the demand for affordable housing is going to continue to 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 increase. Uh, the cost of housing. Um, has continued to increase and as, as housing becomes more expensive affordable workforce housing obviously is not available these are very important programs they're well-run programs they're highly demanded programs um, and, um, and and so yeah I, I will support those one of the biggest bangs for our buck that we get is out of the housing and community development because they their money goes back into the community I think we've seen that here with some uh, locally 20 million um, in our community that will be able to expand that kind of housing initiative. Um, a number of years ago, we did a tax sale initiative that would have, that we had about nine bills, seven of them passed, and it would create a way for um, our communities, our local governments, or municipalities to take blighted and condemn property 
take them off the tax sale, and then be able to create what's called a land bank so that you could work with other private sources of funding and locally create your own opportunities to create affordable workforce housing. In addition to that, this past year, we were able to add to that whole repertoire of tools for local communities where we would not displace people who might lose otherwise lose their homes to so be able to uh, accommodate folks through that tax sale process so that individuals could stay in their home and not be displaced where they didn't have affordable housing. Um, in addition, we have a number of, uh, probably here in Dorchester, have more opportunities for workforce housing right now than they do in other communities. Uh, White Comico has almost no inventory. Um, we're in a position because we have a lot of build going on, and, and that's important to continue to fund resources through housing and community development to make those initi initiatives for even first-time home buyers because there are a lot of opportunities there. In addition to that, local jurisdictions can provide that local tax incentive for um, students coming out, for new teachers, for police, fire, if they want to add that additional time, uh, additional funding. <laughs> Reading the slide. Cool. No, you're good. You're good. You're doing well. All right. This is going to be the last formal question. Um, and I, I saved it to last every one of this. So we've, you've talked about a bunch of things in terms of specific to Dorchester. So this question is pretty generic to say, what special needs do you see in Cambridge, Dorchester, and the Midshore that could be addressed by action of the state legislator that we may not have talked about already tonight? Or you've already talked about it and want to emphasize again. I'm going to be a broken record. <laughs> um, top priority, mm -hmm. designated funding for our wastewater, water um, infrastructure. I just think that's one of the biggest issues that will preserve our economy because it's a lot like broadband. If you don't roll out the broadband, make sure you have the bandwidth and everybody connected and everybody have access like we've worked on really diligently for about the past eight years. Um, if we don't have that in our wastewater treatment sewer system in Dorchester County, our property values will decrease. Despite all the building in the world, it's going to decrease because we have a lot of folks who pay the lion's share of the taxes whose property will devalue. And we can't afford that. We're on the cusp of having a lot of activity right here in Dorchester County with what's going on with the packing house, with the waterfront development. We do have a lot of building going on, but we need to keep up with the infrastructure in addition to that. And we do need to um, make that a priority, I believe. Same question. Yeah, I, I believe in Dorchester County, specifically in, in Cambridge, uh, we've got a situation that could get addressed or get attention um, from the state uh, to deal with crime and, and, and the crime that's been going on. It's, it's, a, it's a challenge. Um, uh, it's not all law enforcement. However, there's a multi-level type approach uh, where we can look exactly at what's going on and start addressing it. Um, we can't hope that it's going to go away. And I think that's a very important issue uh, for the county. Transportation funding. We talked about transportation funding. And I would need to make sure to say get funding to clean the ditches out. You always have to say that. <laughs> but then more importantly, and, and it hadn't been brought up, but there's underway plans for a third Bay Bridge, a third Bay Bridge span. Um, Dorchester County is not included um, and the capacity limits, the traffic flow, the funding. If there's a third bay bridge span and capacity to cross the bay and the same location is increased, um, we want to make sure that Route 50 going through Dorchester County is treated as a priority as part of that third bay bridge. And if we need any resources, uh, that they're available to us and we're included in that. Um, workforce training for Dorchester County is, uh, is very important. We've got some great manufacturing and we've got a great uh, workforce 
uh, making sure that workforce is ready and trained um, will attract more investment in Dorchester County and it'll help us retain uh, the investment uh, that we uh, that we currently have. And again, I mentioned it earlier, um, the ground zero for flooding, um, sea level uh, rise, the uh, climate, all those things, we're, that's Dorchester County. And, and looking at all of the areas that are prone to flooding and getting them studied and getting a plan on what can be saved and how to save whatever is is is, is there uh, is uh, um, I think is a, a, a a viable project and something that should be undertaken all right so to all the questions so now you guys get three minutes each to wrap up Donnie, you had the mic so you can get started and do your three minute wrap up and then add your wrap up and then we'll close this baby out for tonight i want to finish my opening statement yeah, <laughs> yeah. you can do that <laughs> it's been a lot of talking this yeah, evening yeah. yeah so i mean i talked about the yeah, we've been we've talked about this also with mm -hmm. rights of parents and education parents want to know um, you know, supporting teachers and supporting policies and instill children with confidence, reassurance and encouragement and supporting police and all of our first responders um, and, and being an advocate for, uh, uh, for law and order and our law enforcement women and men on the street. Um, also working to protect um, the integrity of our elections. So that concludes my opening statement mm -hmm. and then we'll do the conclusion on the conclusion. Mm -hmm. uh, this is an exciting election. Um, there's a lot of challenges facing us right now. Um, uh, this is a time, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I didn't make the decision to run for the Senate lightly. Um, there's a time where we have a number of challenges that have, that have stemmed from all sorts of different things. And to me, um, it is the right time. Um, I'm excited to be in this race. I'm excited to have the opportunity to serve as your senator. I very much want that opportunity. Um, my plan is to give that job everything I have to give um, and, uh, and to bring uh, the best that I can. A lot in politics, when they have the microphone, they want to make promises and things like that. I try not to do that. Uh, I try to keep my words to the point and try to keep uh, do what I say I'm going to do, so keep my word. Um, and, and, and moving forward as your senator, you can't make promises, but I can tell you I'll show up every day, just like I've done in the House of Delegates. I'll work as hard as I can every day. And I'll be there for you if you ever feel that you need me. Um, and, uh, and I will be straightforward and clear about any questions you have or things that are going on. It's been an incredible honor to serve in the House of Delegates. Um, this is a big election. Um, the election day is July 19th. Early voting is July 7th through July 14th from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Um, and I'm asking for your trust and your vote um, in this upcoming primary election. Uh, thank you very much. So thank you for the opportunity. I want to pick up on a number of, of issues as well that are really important to me that we've worked on through the years. Um, one of the things that we're able to do this past two years that we've worked on for a number of years, we have not adequately funded early childhood education. We haven't adequately, I mean, fact be known, we have some 200 um, people in Maryland who do not have access to health care. We had pregnant moms in our state who did not have access to health care. So that those babies don't quite get the same healthy start and opportunity. So early pregnancy uh, health care is really important. But then being able to provide resources for our kids up to five is critical. This past year, we expanded the child care tax credit so that moms had access to health care, uh, had ha access to child care. You know, through the pandemic, that was exasperated. In addition to that, we were able to provide some incentives for child care expansion and then for child care construction expansion. Three big initiatives because kids do need to be able to come to school ready to learn. In our state, we do not have the kind of resources with, that we need for our kids with special needs. It's hard to find a child psychiatrist or to be able to provide 
kids and adolescents psychiatric care, which is absolutely critical. So our kids are being held in hospitals waiting for beds that go far too long, and we've had to really struggle with how we fund that and how we build those resources. There are ways that we can put together experts to be able to determine what we need to be able to meet the needs of our kids. We are struggling um, with a workforce shortage. Continuing care, nursing homes, we have people who are not faring very well in our continuing care facilities right now because of lack of workforce. I've started a couple initiatives working with the Board of Nursing and working with our directors of those facilities to see what we need to do to expedite entry into practice, to be able to get more folks in, and then provide the kind of scholarship opportunities, educational aid, to make sure that we will have the healthcare workforce that we need moving forward. That's something that I've been fortunate to do. When you're a senator um, and on the budget committee, we get I get to be involved on the ground to know what's working and what's not working so we can make those recommended changes at the policy level through the budget. I've served you for these past eight years and I would like to continue to ask for your vote to send me back to Annapolis as your senator. Thank you. Thank you. A round of applause for the guys tonight. And that, that concludes our former program again. Um, I want to thank WHCP for all the work that they do with making this board, the SPY, and uh, Mitchell Board of Realtors for working with us to pull, pull these seven forms off. Um, as Johnny just pointed out in his closing, early voting starts on the 7th. Uh, the primary is on the 19th. Um, your mail-in ballots have already hit your mailboxes. Don't fill them out till you watch all seven video, or at least watch the ones that pertain to your districts that you live in. At least then, you know, you can vote with a clear conscience because you heard what everybody had to say. Um, again, videos, you can get them on our website, uh, dorchesterchamber.org. You can go find all the videos. This one will be posted tomorrow morning. The other ones are already up there. Um, WHCP is doing playbacks on the weekend, and the SPY is also doing uh, playbacks on these as well. So lots of ways to get this. We encourage you to share with as many people as you can. We want an informed um, voting population, and we want more people to vote. We actually have very vo low voter turnout. July 19th, the primary, the, the decision for this will be made in the primary. You guys, I mean, that's kind of where we're at. So if you don't get out and vote in July, you're not, you're not actually having a vote. So get everybody out, make the, get out and talk to everybody you can to point it out to them, um, whether you vote early, vote through mail, or vote on the 19th, just get out and vote. And thank you very much for tonight, and have a good evening. Drive safely.